Our next panel is one that many of you in the audience should appreciate. Over the last several decades, Austin has been transformed from a sleepy little college town to a, a now a, a, a booming uh, tech center. Uh, many people have compared uh, uh, Silicon, uh, our town to Silicon Valley, even dubbing it Silicon Hills. But is that the right comparison? And where do we stand in regard to that comparison? So we, we've got a great uh, panel of experts here to talk with us about that issue. Uh, the panel moderator is Josh Baer, who's a serial entrepreneur in town and the director of Capital Factory, one of Austin's uh, most distinguished and successful accelerator programs. Josh, uh, I recruited Josh to teach Longhorn Startup, which is a class taught here to uh, undergraduates across the college, across the whole university, but with many students coming from UTCS. And uh, it's been an inc incredibly successful uh, class. Uh, so corner uh, Josh sometime and ask him about it. Until then, I'll let Josh introduce his panel. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Elsie, Tarun, and Ross. Oh, we're losing Tarun. If you guys want to come on, come on and, and roll on, grab your seats up here, I'll, we'll get started. Uh, I'm really glad to be here with you all today. It's uh, uh, so interesting for me because this, this is the room I normally teach my class in. So I was uh, teaching my class here last night. Um, uh, it looks a little different right now, uh, but, uh, but you know, not that different. Um, so, uh, so great to be here. Uh, I'm really excited to share the story with Austin with you today. Uh, I know many of you uh, live here or have gone to school here or have been here, but this place has changed a lot over the past 10, 20 years. Um, and I, so I think you'll be really interested in what you find here today. Uh, real quickly, how many of you live in Austin right now? Okay, mo a lot of you. Okay, so, um, so that will help us tune this a little bit. How many are, are, are went to school here but aren't, don't live here anymore? Okay, good amount of you too. Great. Well, it's been a really great time in Austin. I moved here to Austin in 1999, uh, at the peak of the first dot-com boom, and uh, it was uh, it was a pretty crazy time then. But it, but what we've seen since then is just there was a little bit of a hiccup with the first dot-com crash, and then just up and to the right since then. Just this year, if you look in the headlines, and the headlines have been going for a long time, but just this year, CNBC said that Austin was the number one city in the country to start a new business. Uh, the uh, Kauffman Foundation, which we'll hear more about, but which studies uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems all over the world, ranked Austin the number one startup metro in the United States for the second year in a row. Uh, Indeed, which knows more about the job market than anybody else, studied places for engineers to work, and they found that if you're a software engineer, Austin's the best place to get a job as far as your money going the farthest. You're going to make the most for your cost of living. And somewhat surprising to me that this would be in the same place at the same time, if you're an employer, Austin's the best place to hire software engineers, the best place to get the most bang for your buck with the engineers that you're hiring. Now, there's a bunch of reasons for that. We're going to talk about that some here today. Um, but Austin is totally booming and really doing great. It's, it's a leading entrepreneurial hub for the United States and for, uh, for all the world. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what we got here to talk about tonight. We've got a great panel for you. Uh, myself, uh, again, I'm Josh Baer. Uh, I teach the uh, Longhorn Startup Program here at UT, which is for undergraduate entrepreneurship students. Uh, our undergraduate students with, uh, with startups, with their own ideas. I also, uh, my day job, that's my one night a week, my day job is I run Capital Factory, which is a startup incubator here in Austin, about uh, maybe 10 blocks south of here. We have about 55,000 square feet in the middle of downtown Austin, where about 1,000 entrepreneurs work every day, uh, and they're all building companies, and we basically use them. You, they, we use them to create opportunities for them. Putting all those people together in one place attracts opportunities for them, and really our goal is to help them hire their first employees, get their first investors, and get their first customers to turn them into real businesses. Our panel today um, that you're going to hear from uh, is, is, is really an, a, a great assembly. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about them a little bit more as we go into the discussion. But briefly, uh, Ross Burdorf uh, has been in Austin, I, th I think, probably the longest uh, of everybody here. Uh, Ross, uh, very, in addition to being a UT alum, um, was early at Excite, at How Computing, uh, and then, uh, through many other things, became the founding CTO of HomeAway, another big Austin success story. Uh, he's an active angel investor. Uh, really, could be hard to imagine somebody who have a better perspective on where Austin's been and where it is today. Uh, Elsie, I'm sorry, Elsie, you're going to have to help me with your last name. Elsie Echeverry Carroll? 
All right, good, I'm gonna try at that. Um, is a researcher here at the University of Texas. Uh, and in addition to having a PhD in economics, she's got a Kauffman Foundation grant that she's been using to study the entrepreneurial ecosystem here. I've been working with her on that for the past couple months, and she's gonna share some of her results here today. And then finally, Tarun Nimigata, they're testing me on all these today, but uh, I should have practiced more, I apologize. Um, but Tarun, who's another good friend of mine I've known for a long time, uh, is another UT alum. Uh, he started his company, Mutual Mobile, the same year that I started Capital Factory in 2009, uh, here while he was a student at UT with a bunch of his classmates. And it grew to be one of the largest mobile development companies in the world, very successful company here in Austin. And so he's lived it as much as anybody else, uh, being here at the university, starting a company, growing it, and seeing how that's changed over the past couple of years. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, sat on the mic. Okay. Thanks for saying that. All right, so to start off, uh, Ross, yes. so as I said, I think you've probably been involved in the startup scene the longest of, of all of us on the panel, um, although I have less hair. Um, <laughs> and you know, started in the 80s, as I said before, with positions at Data General, at Tandem Computing, at HAL Computing, and then Excite, which was, uh, you know, as for many of us will remember, a, a big uh, kind of dot-com 1.0 company uh, running the engineering team here in Austin. How did sleepy little Austin, as I hear it so commonly referred to, uh, become the leading tech hub in the United States? Was there any specific events that kind of kicked this off that stick out in your mind? Like, oh, when that happened, that, that started it. Well, I mean, I think... Uh, oh, let me give you oh, the sorry, mic. Sorry, sorry. Right. You have to pass that. Uh, thanks for having me here, and um, what a great crew, and, and, and uh, you know, thanks for pulling this together. I think if you talk to some of the old timers in Austin, and I can remember this, is, you know, it really started with uh, something... Uh, Bobby Inman and MCC, really bringing this uh, MCC to Austin, Texas is, was a fundamental piece. And uh, I hope we're going to hear on research of, uh, you know, how you start uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So I think that was the hub, bringing technology here. That was the start of it. I also feel like uh, the university and the CS department, University of Texas, is a, you know, a huge part of that whole technology. Another statistic that you didn't uh, list was Austin's the fifth most educated uh, town in the U.S. Wow. So I think, you know, when you're an employer, you're looking for that, um, you know, creative class. So I think it really started with MCC. Then one of my first employers that actually came as a result of MCC was Data General, you know. And then after that, uh, IBM, of course, was a big anchor here. And, you know, we've got some more big silicon anchors here. Um, Texas Instruments and Motorola is a, also a big employer. So I think that all started with MCC. And then, you know, I think it's just taken off with the, the whole dot-com boom. If you look at IBM and uh, one of the companies I first worked with, which was at the, the uh, ATI incubator, the university incubator, we had space for them, was HAL Computer Systems. HAL Computer Systems was, you know, started uh, by an IBM fellow. It was in Austin and out in Silicon Valley also. That was one of the first big startups here in town. And I think, you know, the ecosystem really starts with these startups and then spins off. If you look at uh, up to, you know, HomeAway, you look at HomeAway, it's already starting to spin off multiple companies, many of which I've invested in, many I've started. I'm starting another one. So I think, you know, and we were just talking last night, just in Silicon Valley, you know, the number of founders that came out of Sun Microsystems, I don't know, you know, uh, there's lots of older people, they know what Sun They're Microsystems are here. <laughs> Some of the, the uh, younger ones are with Sun Microsystems. So, you know, I think it spins off and you get this ecosystem, uh, you know, going. And I think, you know, it's also the connections that can be made amongst entrepreneurs of places like Capital Factory get started as a result of, uh, you know, like-minded people getting together. Yeah, so MCC is definitely the top of my list. When I talk to people about this, and as I've asked people about it, that's always one of the first things that comes up. Elsie? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, indeed, MCC, and I think we all agree, MCC and Semitech. MCC came here in 1983, Semitech in 1987. It basically put Austin in the high-tech map. However, I would like to emphasize that six companies that 
MCC, MCC was a, a consortium of 14 companies. Six of those companies were already in Austin. IBM came in 1967. IBM really, really, when you interview people that were at that time with IBM, talk about how IBM revolutionized the way that business was done in the city. I mean, the magnitude of IBM, Austin was not used to provide services or to provide inputs for that kind of, you know, that size of business. So I like to think that, that uh, our estimates show that before 19, in 1980, already 13% of the employment or the full-time employment in the city was actually provided by the high-tech industry. So this was a cluster. It, they were few, but they were large. And I think what really makes the difference is the University of Texas, and in particular the computer science department and the electrical engineering department at that time that became the electrical and computer you know, department. So I like definitely what you said, you know, the role of the university has been very, very important since the beginning. Yeah. And just to get everybody, in case you're not familiar with MCC, we keep using that acronym. It's not called that anymore. MCC stood for the Microelectronics Con Con Computer Consortium. And as you say, it was a consortium put together with a bunch of large companies. And just like when the, they have, when I figure out where the next Olympics is going to be, they have an RFP and all these cities compete. There was an RFP for where this big research consortium was going to be in the US. And at the time, they weren't worried about the Chinese or the Russians. It was the Japanese and chips and semiconductors. And the Japanese were going to out-innovate us. And we needed to get together to compete with them. And so Austin, with uh, the help of George Kosmetsky and Bobby Inman and Pike Powers, many other people competed in that bid to be the place and won the bid to have it come here. Uh, and uh, as you know, Elsie, you, you said there was already a big foundation here of tech, uh, which I believe, but it does seem like everybody I talked to point that was the time, that was it, that was the thing. When MCC came, that put us on the map, and that brought all this investment here, and that got everybody thinking about it. So that does seem to be a really key point. Um, you know, two things. There, I feel like there were two really big things that didn't come up, and I'm sure you know. Obviously, there's a lot of things to talk about. But um, so, what about Dell? Anybody want to talk about Dell? Yeah, I mean, I think that's. A I, th I think that's a. I think that's a great point. I am showing my age here. I mean, you know, I remember when Dell started. There was also uh, I'm trying to think of it. There was also a big competitor at the time, which was much bigger. Compaq. No. CompuAd. But who who was in town here? There was also a big competitor in town that was doing mail order, that was in the magazines. That was much bigger than Dell at the time. Yeah, maybe it was Gateway. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Austin Computers. But they were also very big, and so, you know, so of course Dell, you know, brought it online and made it a big deal. So yeah, I mean, I think Dell is, an, is another big homegrown, you know, started, went to school here at UT. We take it for granted, but that was going on at the, the time. I can remember the original office over there on metric, you know, I even, and again, you know, I think there's a fundamental piece in all of this. We all think it's such a, uh, a big, you know, globe it's so very small even when you go out to silicon valley in here everyone knows everyone i can can't tell you the number of you know we always say you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a trilogy person you can't i'm a trilogy person yeah so you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a, a dell person you know every you know all of these executives and people i mean i know you know big time retired executives talk at dell talk about the, when they would build the computers, everyone would go down on the floor and build the computers before the end of the month so they could make, you know, get all the revenue out the door, you know, even Michael himself. So it's still a very small town, and the point I'm making here is that it really is about relationships and the ability to work together and create these big, powerful networks, I think, you know. Yeah. I think one of the things that's different about Dell than the other companies that we mentioned here is Dell was a startup, yeah. right? IBM wasn't a startup. And so, and part of what happens when a startup goes from being a guy in his dorm room assembling computers to a $35 billion company or whatever it happens to be today is obviously there's so much growth in that time and the, there's so many people that develop so many skills, expertise, they form teams, they learn other people to work with, they learn about customer problems, they, they acquire wealth, which then lets them go start their own company, start a new company, become a venture capitalist, invest in companies. And I think for me, that was the thing about Dell that was really different is it created that, it started that flywheel going of a successful outcome that then produced teams, investors, entrepreneurs, all these other things that came out of it. I mean, the first Dell computers, those hardware engineers came from Tandem Computers. I know them. 
by name. I mean, they built the first Dell machine. We're, you know, building terminals yep. here in here in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Elsie. Now that you mentioned about Dell and 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 the fact that it, it was it's a homegrown company and definitely you know transformed the city in many ways. Uh, Tracor was a spin-off from the University of Texas, 1955. Wh which one? Tracor. 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 Yeah, 1955. Right. And and the 1955 a spin-off from the University of Texas. That's a huge com became a huge company. And then also National Instruments was also a spin-off from the University of Texas in the really? 1960s. Yes. Wow. Uh huh. So, so and, and Dell uh, Tivoli is, is a lot later, but it's not from UT, it's not a spin-off from UT. Uh, uh, so the University of Texas also contributed, and I like to think about Dell, even that Dell really was not a spin-off from UT, the reality is that I heard many people talking about how Michael Dell used to meet with George Kosmeski at the IC Square Institute and go well, I think over there. It's an honorary spin-out. It did start in a dorm room here. Exactly, I mean, exactly. <laughs> but I mean, the, the influence of UT is, is, is present even in a company like that. So, yeah. so I like to think that it's, it's not necessarily a spin-off, it's kind of a spin-off from, from, from UT. So Tarun, uh, there's one other thing we didn't mention yet that's kind of an elephant in the room that you might have a perspective on, because I think it's, it's become more of, a, of an influence, of, particularly over the past five or 10 years. So what about South by Southwest? Yeah, that, that definitely, for me, was uh, probably, a, I, I noticed the influence of that, because you know, I, I, I didn't get to experience the, you know, the Dell wave and the Trilogy wave. But you know, right as we were you know, um, you know, graduating about you know, 2008 or so, South by really started to you know, take off and put Austin on the map and you know they you know talk about how half the companies here, um, uh, in, in you know ha about half the big tech companies are created by immigrants, and you know South by I think is responsible for a lot of Austin, Austin immigration, immigration, right? Yeah. And that's so much of you know I think what's happened in Austin has happened not just because of all of the amazing people that have been here, but how South by has been able to attract so many new people from startup capitals and uh, you know outside influences you know to Austin um, so uh, thankfully it rained every South by for the first few years and then but but then as soon as the the rain stopped people started to figure out that Austin was amazing and um, I remember when we were starting to uh, you know when we started the company like probably a third of the people that we hired um, we we were we relocated from other parts of the country and that was uh, that was also, I think, easy to do because of Austin's cost of living and how attractive a, a, of a place it was and has been to move. I think UT has also benefited from that in, in, in its recruiting. Yeah, I agree. Mike, can I keep the mic for a second? If, uh, um, so you're just an ad? No, no. Okay. Um, so, Turin, you, you started Mutual Mobile, as I said before, with a handful of other students. Uh, was, I mean, I guess maybe I got this wrong. Was it while you were at UT or right after you graduated? So, um, while we were at UT, we started a, uh, a club called uh, the Smartphone Entrepreneurs Homebrew Computer Club. club. It was basically like that, but for, but for the smartphone era, and got a bunch of people together to, um, to, you know, to build apps you know, for the iPhone. And, and it, you know, were there other clubs like that at uh, UT? Were there uh, entrepreneur well, clubs? Or th there's a lot of know, them now. There are now, and back then, I think entrepreneurship wasn't actually a a, a real kind of thing. Um, it, and and now it's you know I walk around and I see posters all over the place for you know competitions I, I and yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's and it's fantastic. There's so many more resources. Um, uh, I you know I think I the the first club that I started was actually the Longhorn Fashion Club, which was a modeling competition that Obviously. was mostly to beat girls. Um, and then the sm and the smartphone entrepreneurs club was then turned into a business. So I can see which one worked better for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, so so and the, your company, as I mentioned, went on to actually become. You started the mobile development group here in Austin. They became, I, I'm going to say, one of the largest. Was it the largest mobile development group in the world? At one point, it was, wasn't it? Like yeah, I think with, as a as a pure play, I think there's a lot of companies that have big mobile teams now. But as a pure mobile company, we're you know we're the largest independent. Uh, so, compare and contrast. You know, like you're you're not that far out of school, and you know you're still here and you're around. 
what, what, would, what's, what would be different starting your company when you did then versus if you were to start it today? Better, worse, harder, easier, what's different? It's, it's an interesting question. Um, let's just start with uh, the things that made it easy. Um, this, is, this might seem counterintuitive, but um, w uh, as we were graduating 2008, you know, that was you know, recession. And um, so we tried raising money for the first you know, little bit, and that, that was not really a good time to be raising money. Um, that was when Sequoia put out the, the death memo. Yep. It was like, all startups will die, like, save all money you have. Like, yeah. yeah. And surprisingly, uh, we ended up you know, figuring out our own path to success, which was to completely bootstrap the business and grow, and that's part of why we ended up being a services business. Um, but th the recessions can be a great time to start a business because we were able to get our first office for you know next to nothing. We were able to recruit people for really cheap. Um, uh, we were able to hire people on contract, amazing people, without having to compete with full-time offers. Um, so there's many ways in which I think the recession and when times are you know tough and bad they can create the right kind of environment. Um, there was also not a lot of noise. The people that were into entrepreneurship, you know, it wasn't because it was fashionable. You know, today I it see- It wasn't because they were at the fashion meetup. They were not. <laughs> and I think, you know, today I think it, you, there's, there's, a lot, there's a lot more of it, which can be good and bad. And now you have to kind of sift through the noise and why people are doing it. But I think what's really cool now is it's starting to become clear to more and more people that entrepreneurship is not just uh, for someone that doesn't get a job at National Instruments. Um, they rejected me to, for, for an internship. Um, they <laughs> but you know, it's, uh, um, uh, but and are also for someone that's probably not gonna get to go to a great uh, grad school because they didn't have good grades. Dr. Steve Keckley here told me I had no chance. <laughs> um, but, but you know, it is a legitimate, <laughs> You, you, yeah, yeah. Well, class interferes with building Wait, companies. Who are you again? Uh, but you know, there there is now you know a third, uh, like I think a third path to uh, to you know being successful and creating value, um, which is to you know start your own company. And, and I think America, you know, just uh, I'm an immigrant. I'm from India. So one of the, the amazing things that I found here is that. Failure is treated so differently in this, in this country than uh, so many other places in the world that it is just you know, a step on the way to success and hopefully you're, just, you know, you're building you know, to that moment. Whereas countries like, you know, like India, we, failure is failure. Now you're, you're, you're seen as someone that can't you know, achieve. Um, and I think that's something that's just really, really worth celebrating is not just the Austin part of where we are, but the, the, the American, um, you know, the American idea, the, the meritocracy sort of nature of the opportunities that we have. And that's I think great. I gave you your first contract, right? Yeah, you, you, one, of my, one of my first big clients. Yeah. I had five, you know, five. I said, how many employees? And you sheepishly said, I've got five employees. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great story. Um, okay, so, so I think this you know, could be for any or all of you, but so we've just talked about the history. We've talked about the, what the laid the foundation. We've talked about all these great things that built up Austin to be what it is. And yet, something changed in the past couple of years, like the past five or ten years, right? Like, with all that was a long time ago, and like, it was like hockey stick, right? Like, I mean, I felt it. I know you, I th you, think you guys felt it. Like, something's different now. So what's changed in the past five years? Why, why suddenly now? Is everything popping, and Austin's on the top of every top ten list, and what's different? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's critical mass. I do think, you know, Austin's the, the growth, the critical mass. It's, it's now, you know, I think the number two player in the U.S. with respect to I, – I, we should ne we're not ever going to be Silicon Valley. Yeah. And, you know, we just – there's too much infrastructure and too big. But I think, you know, Austin's finally come to – a critical mass, and I use the example, I always use the example of, you know, I don't know if it was the second year or whatever when we were at folding tables and Josh would come to me and, hey, will you buy pizzas for us for, right, for, Capital, Factory. for Capital Factory, and we'd meet on folding tables, 
And we used to, when we'd angel invest in the companies, I, I think I called it welfare. <laughs> is that the, the, the companies were of such low quality, but great people, you know? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, it really we, literally- we, we, there, was a, there was a gem in there. There was a gem in there, <laughs> that's right. And, and um, uh, but then it re really changed. It started to change next year, and we all yeah. noticed it. So I think there, there was this, as the economy changed and as Austin changed, and I mean, if you look at the statistics, I just, I'm on the board of KLRU, and I met with the city and their statistics, and it's just, it's insane. I mean, the, the growth here, and I think it's, is, as indeed, you know, the, it's the number one place for developers, so it's a great place to start a business. And if you look at the other big tech hub, I think people are exiting California to come here, and we're oh, yeah. seeing it. We're seeing it both. That's at where they're moving. One of the other headlines I didn't have my slides here. But one of my other headlines I usually show is the like the headlines: why businesses are fleeing California for Texas, right? It's right. Like, so uh, I think it's the infrastructure of Texas, and just and Austin's just a great place to uh, live. And then yeah. you have things like this. Elsie, what have you found? Okay. <laughs> I agree with you completely. I mean, it's the, this critical mass now. Argue with us. We need a more like. <laughs> but 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 no. Panel. But but I, I think uh, I would like to. Uh, what I was talking to you in the beginning. I think one of the major things that I'm finding, and 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 I work with data. I mean, we have we bought uh, twelve thousand five hundred dollars with money from the Kaufman Foundation, that basically have all the establishments in Austin from nineteen. 90 to 2013, and uh, and we work with the, we review the literature. What what is that the entrepreneurial literature said about how these events happen, and 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 what is beautiful about the Kaufman Foundation, which is very different, for example, from the NSF, is that they require that we are constantly in contact with the entrepreneurial community. So I have conducted about 40 interviews, including Josh which I interview, and I hope that I can interview you and you also, I was hoping that <laughs> today. Uh, and really what I learned is that what happened in Austin and, that, and why the growth started in, in 2010, and the data shows that actually. You can see a, a spi spike up of entrepreneurial activity, high-tech entrepreneurial activity after the, the financial cri crisis in 2008-2009. So there are, of course, Austin has become more a software, uh, 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 in terms of high tech, a software-oriented city. And there has been technological advancements that we know that make a lot cheaper to, pr to create a startup. So we have the danger that you were talking about of people creating companies. And, and I remember Gordon Daugherty telling me, I wonder how many of these companies are going to die pretty soon because, I mean, you have the, it's a lot cheaper to do it, it's a lot easier to do it. But I think I love when I interview Josh because basically I think that they are one of the functions that, two, two things that I, that I was really impressed. I mean, one is that they, they are screening these companies, they are helping people to see, I really can, I really not, I really don't want to be an entrepreneur. I think that I, I thought that I could be an entrepreneur, but I really don't want to be an entrepreneur. At the same time, people like you that realize this is what I want to do. So you give that opportunity to a lot of, a lot of want, want entre, want entrepreneurs, as, as Gordon defined it. Entrepreneurs, yes. <laughs> entrepreneurs. But I think what, why do we, beside these, these technological changes that basically facilitate the creation of a software startup in any place in the world. So the question is why Austin? Why do we see that growth in, in, in entrepreneurial activity, high-tech entrepreneurial activity, and particularly in the software industry? And based on the interviews, not based on the literature, the literature usually takes a while to catch up with what's happening in reality. And I think that what I'm starting to see is that in the beginning, those large companies that we were talking about they were training people, they were uh, uh, buying some of these companies, so, they, so it's called corporate uh, 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 incubators. So basically these large companies act as incubators uh, and, and people leave the companies. IBM, uh, Tivoli for example, was created by three engineers from IBM. 
Tivoli was bought in six years after it was created by IBM for 750 million in 1996. 750 million in 1996, that was a huge, a huge you know, deal. So in the interviews, many people mentioned Tivoli as the big bang of the software industry in Austin. Then we started to see that the entrepreneurs themselves, and I think you mentioned that, started to create this company. So for example, from the people that work in Tivoli, we identify about 29 uh, startups that those people leave Tivoli and create the startups. And about 20, I believe, of these uh, people that work for Tivoli and went to work as top managers for other startups. So it creates this critical mass, this multiplier effects. But what is really fascinating now is, and I think you mentioned that, is the community of entrepreneurs. And it was in an interview with, I s interviewed several people from Indeed that this came out and they said, there used to be entrepreneurs, but before, uh, before Josh, there was not a community of entrepreneurs. So what is happening, what I started to see now is that entrepreneur, the, 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 these guys that are creating these startups, the most recent ones, they never work for a large company. They never work for an entrepreneurial company that grew really fast so they can learn in that process. But they benefit from this community of entrepreneurs that help them to actually create successful companies so they don't need to work for anybody else. So I think that, so when people talk about are we going to become the Silicon Valley, I like to think that this, what the Silicon Valley is, is ahead of us in terms of this community of entrepreneurs, these entrepreneurs that fund companies, you know, they give money to companies, they, they give mentorship to companies. I mean, they really, and they connect and network each other. And, and you just say it, I mean, we all know each other. Doing this research, I'm like shocked. I mean, like everybody knows each other. That is a community of entrepreneurs. And that's what we are starting to see now. And that's why we see this transformation in the city. And that's not in the Lirera Shur, by the way. The Lirera Shur is kind of talk about a lot about these corporate entrepreneurs. Talk a lot, some, some, especially in the financial Lirera Shur, about these uh, 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 entrepreneurial spawning effects. But this community of entrepreneurs, and, and, and by the way, that's the hardest thing to reproduce. If you think about, for example, Guadalajara or any place like that that wants to become the next uh, uh, high-tech city, is the community of entrepreneurs where it's difficult to understand how is what created, how it happened, how they connect, how they realize that by being together, they can multiply these processes. And it's funny that you say that a lot of people come to me from different cities, uh, mostly because everyone's are just looking at Austin, right? Everyone's got their eyes on Austin. Austin's booming and growing. We get delegations of chambers of commerce from other cities or government leaders or whatever. They're all coming by and they want to see everything going on here. And so a lot of them come and they, they come visit Capital Factory and they come to UT and they say, hey, we want to go, how do we go do this in our city? We want to come, come make a Capital Factory there. And I, and I get asked that a lot. And, uh, and I've, I've, I've never done that. And while other people have extended the co-working business model to other places, well, kind of what you're saying is part of where I get stuck. I'm like, well, I can't bring Capital Factory there because I don't want to go there. Like, and like Capital Factory is all about people. Like, that's what it is. And so, to make Capital Factory somewhere, we need a me there. Not that I'm all of Capital Factory; it's much bigger than me. But but you need, you need who's going to go start it? Who's going to be the person? If you have that person, why do you need me? And you didn't come, and right? You, you know, like yeah, and um, you didn't show up here if it wasn't for. Uh, trilogy. trilogy. Yep. You know, I mean, and I, I, yeah, I, and I Which was another very powerful connected ne community exactly. and network. It, it, in fact, it is. And, and still and is. I can't, it, my example of this, so the latest company I helped. Can you give them the mic? Oh, sorry. The latest company I helped uh, kick off and I'm an advisor is Hangar. It's in the drone space. And, you know. It is the drone space. It is the drone space. And so we kicked it off. And the other day, here comes in Andrew Heller that I hadn't seen in 30 years, a fellow from IBM. I mean, we cannot overstate the impact that IBM had on Austin. Started Hal Computer Systems, you know, where I got my big start uh, in entrepreneurship, you know, and we're hugging, he's an old man, I'm not as old as him. And I mean, you know, and he's involved in this young startup. And I mean, you know, the, just the network and that infrastructure of support. And I mean, and I think it goes both ways. I think if the, I'm still very young, just like you are, 
And, uh, Just but keep I, telling yourself that. I keep telling myself that. But what's exciting for me is I really try to yearn to learn from these young entrepreneurs because they have a lot to teach everyone too. So it's a two-way street. And that, you know, I think that network, there's no shortcut to that network because I get ex you know, asked about this same question. There is no shortcut. It Capital is Factory is the shortcut. <laughs> but not in another. You cannot move cap, know, yeah, Capital yeah, yes, Factory yes, to yeah, yeah, you're right. some other town. Yeah. Can I just say something very short? I mean, the, the, when I interviewed Josh and he told me Capital Factory has about 1,000 events a year and 50,000 people participate in these events. And, and my, my goal is to have 100,000 people participate in events here. I thought this is exactly a community of entrepreneurs. I mean, you made me think about that. I thought, what is this? If this is not about, this is a community of entrepreneurs. Just to, to your point, Ross, um, uh, th the mentorship, I think, is just yeah, hugely important. Actually, my mentor, Steven Strauss, is here. We, he's uh, ex-Austin Ventures and definitely would not have you know, been able to you know, you know, do what we did without, without that sort of advice and, and, and mentorship. And obviously, Josh has got a network of mentors helping entrepreneurs, and that's a big part of what Capital Factory does. And people like Ross advising so many, you know, startups, you know, here in town. I think it is the process of people that have been successful making the time to be a part of that community and not sort of withdraw from the community and just sort of do what they're doing is so, so, so important. I think it's hard to do when the business is exploding and has all this growth and the, you don't have any time to give, you know, to give your time back. But, you know, next generation of entrepreneurs it's it, they're not just going to come out of nowhere. It's a, it, it, everybody's got somebody that they have to thank, you know, for you know for their success. Yeah. So we only have a few more minutes, and I think probably uh, uh, I had ten questions. We made it through about three of them, um, <laughs> and uh, but fortunately, I think we, we've touched on a lot of good parts of that. So you know, I think one thing I want to be sure to to maybe touch on, and, and I don't know if this is the closing or not, but is let's talk about Silicon Valley. You know, everybody. Uh, you know, the instinct of every community that's in startups outside of Silicon Valley is the question is always, well, how do we become the next Silicon Valley? Um, and, we, we, and then I think we've all been hearing that long enough that many of us are tired of hearing that. We heard Elsie say, you know, and, and maybe I think Ross piled on, you know, well, we're clearly not going to be Silicon Valley, but what can we be? Um, I think, you know, for many other communities that I meet that are coming to Austin, they see Austin, and I think they're realizing this too. They realize, they say, you know, actually, we know we're never going to be Silicon Valley, but if we try really hard, maybe we could be Austin someday. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry to think of Austin as like the aspirational city. That's where this, we're the city everybody wants to be. Um, but in the way that we're, one way that I think we're still really lacking, and I'm curious if you have other ways um, from Silicon Valley, is, and it is the community and the ecosystem, is that in Silicon Valley, what, what I feel like where they are further ahead of us on that cycle that Elsie talked about, is we've got the entrepreneurial community in cycle going, but they have a community of companies mm -hmm. on top of that. And what happens in Silicon Valley that doesn't happen here is if you have a team that's working on something and it's not going to be the next Google or the next Facebook, one of the other companies buys it. And in Austin, it just goes out of business. And that is actually a huge difference because what happens is when the company goes out of business, the money just disappears. It's just, it's gone, it's destructive. And when the other company buys, the, other, you know, the bigger company buys a smaller company, which they consider an aqua hire and is not a big deal for them, it still pays off all the investors. And actually, the founders probably even make what in Austin would be considered to be making some good money. Um, but it's just not some huge big success story. But it's not a zero. And in my experience, what happens with an angel investor is if, if they invest money in a company and it tanks, the money's gone. Say they just get their money back. It wasn't a big success, it wasn't a big home run, but they, they just get their money back. What do they do? They will immediately put that money in another company. That's just, I think that's just, that's my experience, that's the way angel investors think. That money's been allocated, they already spent it, and it's like, great, and they'll, and they'll invest that right in another company. And I think that's one piece we're really missing in the ecosystem here compared to Silicon Valley, is that they have the ecosystem of the companies that will acquire or eat the smaller companies in a very good way that actually is more sustainable. So curious, it, you know, one, do you see that too? Um, and do you see any other big challenges of, you know, what does Austin need to do to evolve to, to the next city? Um, yeah, I think this is really interesting. Uh, you know, we 
we started a Silicon Valley office actually for, for a bit and then we closed it. Um, and we always thought a lot about moving to Silicon Valley, sort of like the Hollywood of you know the tech industry, right? Like it was like why? Like if you're gonna start a tech company, why would you not be in the Valley? Um, but I think Austin's definitely got its own unique advantages, and I think you're absolutely right. We got to find our own path, our own trajectory, you know, to success. One of the big advantages I think that we have is we have a lot of other industries that are outside of technology, and the one of the biggest waves that we're seeing in the world is that technology has this potential to change not just the technology industry, but to change every other industry. And I think Steve Case talked about it recently, but you know, if you look at all of the other uh, sectors of the economy and the potential for digital disruption to happen, whether it's you know, housing or food or construction or government, um, or government yeah, you, you look at oil and gas, I mean, there's energy, there's, there's so many other sectors of the economy that are starting to become um, you know, or CPG, um, and there's a whole that's that brings I think a whole new set of acquirers. Before you could only get acquired if you start a tech company, you would only get acquired by a tech company. But now you've got you know companies like you know Unilever. Goldman Sachs acquired Honest Dollar. That's right. right. You've got all these new acquirers. Like how come these companies are acquiring tech companies? Well, it's because I think tech's got this incredible pervasive sort of effect. Um, so there's um. The biggest criticism that I have, I think, with, with Austin is probably this, the ge general sort of feels like a lack of ambition um, because um, people can, you know, have like a little small exit and you could live such a high quality life in Austin without, you know, much money at all. Um, and, and, it, it's, and it's almost like it's hard to get yourself to be as you know, aggressive about growth and, you know, uh, growing a business. So that feels like it's missing compared to San Francisco and New York. But what we have in place of that is probably a much more sort of supportive ecosystem where entrepreneurs are helping each other and there's not nearly as much of that sort of competitive, um, as much of that competitive vibe. Um, B2C is also really lacking, you know, in Austin. Um, so. You can start an enterprise software company in Austin pretty easily, and there's a lot of talent available, a lot of companies, a lot of people with experience. But where's our big, you know, consumer, you know, success? And I think it's still we don't have that credibility to start any kind of company. We have we have certain kinds of companies that I think we can start to build, you know, momentum around. Um, and my, I think my best sort of thesis on where Austin's going to get its growth is not by competing head to head on, on tech, but, um, but, but sort of tech enabled uh, or digitization or digital transformation of non-tech sectors. You know, it's funny, uh, I, don't, I can't remember if it was Steve Case that said this to me or if it was somebody else, but it was right around that same time when he was promoting his new book and he was here in Austin. And uh, someone made a comment that I found very, just very insightful. Um, and that I, w I wish someone had said 10 years ago about how they've noticed that, you know, it used to be the big industries that some of the ones you talked about all would say, oh, well, they don't understand our industry. The tech people, they could never, they don't even get it. They could never come in and revolutionize our industry. And it seems like it turns out that it's much, much easier for a tech company to hire the experts from an industry than it is for the industry experts to hire tech people to go do something. And that, that, that switch, I don't know if that made sense, but it's like, it, it turns out like, actually no, we can understand your business. Like we can go hire, in fact, all of the experts from your business would love to come work for us and join our thing and come up with the thing to disrupt you. And I think we see that happening more. Now part of Steve's point was, I think there needs to be some, there needs to be more collaboration there with these big industries that are gonna happen. But it's, totally. it's been pretty interesting. Digital is almost like, it's, it's more than just the technology, right? There's a, there's a whole culture and a way of life and a way of thinking that sort of comes along with it that is sort of born out of the tech industry that is just as, I think it's hard, it's a hard pill for a lot of old businesses to swallow. And it is that, that way of thinking that is starting to swallow those other industries as much as it is the tech itself. Yeah. We're just about out of time. Any last comments yeah, from Elsie I mean, and Ross? I, 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 you know, um, on the challenges for Austin, I mean, I'm a, I view this very rationally in, in the study, uh, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship. The reason we don't have big, uh, you know, you know, to, to consumer focus is because one of them hasn't happened in Austin. 
and and it happens out in the valley. So you know, it's I kind of a catch twenty two. You it need the first one to kick it well, off. But you will, you know, the latest round of spinoffs from the latest successes at HomeAway, they are very much more focused on uh, consumers and bigger plays. Favor, favor. I mean, I think, you know, so it just has to happen. For me, it's all about the infrastructure, and the infrastructure is growing in, in in Austin. And I also just think of the the spin-offs on, in the venture world, how many now venture funds we have that have spun off. So there's you know no real barrier to money here in Austin. I think as that infrastructure uh, continues to build, we'll see more of it. And you know I do, I come right back to UT and the computer science department. It starts here with this great talent and a great source of talent. And I'll close with that. Starts here, changes the world. LT, anything else you want to add? Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah, when I, when I look at the data about the computer science department, I was like, wow. A computer science department like, since the 1990 has been in the top 10. And today is like the number six in terms of research and development expenditure. And the, num the, the amount of money have, you know, in research and development has increased from about $10 million in the 1990s to around $60 million in the last five years. So. Computer science department definitely, I agree, has been a very important uh, component. Yeah, just yeah, the CS department. Obviously, ho ho we're very grateful for the experiences there. You know, Peter in the back um, started uh, a uh, an autonomous car, um, you know, project, which was really kind of an entrepreneurial sort of, you know, kind of an environment and a hotbed. And so much of other research, I think, is very entrepreneurial, and it goes under under recognized um, but you know I definitely encourage folks to kind of look look at UTCS more and you know kind of figure out a way to connect the dots between you know startups and computer sciences as, as you've been doing awesome well, Tarun Elsie Ross thank you so much for joining us and thank you all for being here today <laughs> yeah.